Our last speaker this afternoon is Jeremy White. The title of his talk is Visualizing the Performance of the World's Greatest Athletes. Jeremy White is currently a graphics editor for the New York Times and an adjunct professor at Columbia University. He's a designer, animator, coder, cartographer, photographer, and data visualization enthusiast. He has contributed a variety of visual projects that have earned several Emmy nominations, a Peabody Award, and top honors from the Society of New Designs, World Press, Photo, and Pictures of the Year International. Prior to joining the Times, he created motion, interactive, and print graphics for the company he founded in 1998, Blue Shirt, serving clients such as Toyota, Fiat, Sony, and Microsoft. All right, Jeremy, let's see some pretty visualizations, please. Yes, good start. All right, so um, I, uh, I'm Jeremy White. I work for the New York Times. Uh, I've been at the Times for about, um, that's my last slide. I want to start at the end. It'll be very short. <laughs> Um, I've been in uh, at the Times for about 10 years, uh, and I work in graphics. A, um, and I work with some pretty talented graphics editors and, and journalists and photographers to help cover the Olympics for the Times. Um, I've gone to the last two Olympics, uh, summer in Rio and winter in Pyeongchang, um, and was supposed to go to Japan, but as we all know, that's been postponed. So um, I want to cover some of the uh, techniques that we use to visualize, visualize uh, performances and some of the skill sets of uh, Olympic athletes. Um, so let's start by looking at some of the charting techniques we've used for different data types. Um, we'll do medal counts for both summer and winter games. And these uh, bubble charts are a good way to show um, these medal counts. They're, they're great at showing proportion. And they fit neatly and are very compact and they animate well, and uh, we've used them for uh, other types of data, not just for um, Olympic medal counts. Uh, Gregor Aish and Larry Buchanan um, put together some stream graphs, um, and stream graphs are a good way to show the same thing, to show medal counts. Uh, and what I, what I like about the stream graphs for things like medal counts is that the uh, gaps are easy to spot. So you could see where the games weren't held or where there were boycott, uh, boycotts. So I kind of like this uh, visualization technique for highlighting things like that. So they went through and they made a couple of, uh, quite a few actually, uh, stream graphs of different um, events, um, different sports and different categories of sports. This was for running. Um, so you can see the East, uh, East German dominance after 1968 and then uh, a rise in the Soviet medals in the late 70s and early 80s. And then the US regained uh, control and Jamaican runners uh, collecting a lot of medals starting the, in the late 80s. And um, stream graphs are especially good at showing variety. So a lot of uh, variety in medal winners after uh, 1996 in the modern pentathlon. Um, in the lead up to the 2016 Rio Olympics, um, Derek Watkins and Larry published a story about how Michael Phelps is basically competing with himself. Um, and this is a good example of uh, how showing how an athlete might intentionally underperform when training for something more important. So you can see that uh, those slower times for Phelps under the 2016 Olympic qualifying times line and um, you can also see his dominance at, uh, in 2008 when he won gold in uh, all of his events. Um, here's another way of looking at medal counts. Josh Katz uh, answers the question, which country leads in the medal count? Well, it, because it depends on how you count the medals. So if let's say a, uh, gold medal is worth um, the same as a silver medal, then the rankings are going to be different. But if a silver medal is worth one bronze, uh, a country like Sweden, you're going to see um, their medal counts, their placement is going to be different. If their silver medal is worth uh, 200 bronze medals, um, the ranking will change. So it depends on how you count the medals. Um, we'll give you uh, a good indication of who's winning the medal counts. But for Winter Olympics, by any standard, Norway is winning. 
Um, sometimes we have to look at some of the more grim aspects of athletics, um, for example, doping. And uh, in this story, Gregor Aish and, and KK Rebecca Lai looked at uh, 31 uh, medalists in Rio who won medals but were previously suspended for doping. In total, there were about 120 athletes who were uh, who competed in Rio but had uh, previously been suspended for doping. And um, some of those athletes had been suspended multiple times. So you can see here, uh, Justin Gatlin suspended multiple times but also has many gold medals or many medals to his name. Hmm. Uh, the doping graphics were a, a follow to another story uh, that Rebecca worked on that looked at how um, medal winners were affected by doping. So uh, when these medals uh, are stripped, you get uh, other athletes taking their place. So I like the headshots and the flags um, that she used instead of just using a list of names or, or a list of nations. Um, because I think it gives the athletes another chance to be recognized, and uh, in some cases, years later. Um, and here, the fourth place finishers then uh, are getting a bronze medal, uh, and hopefully that takes the sting off of a fourth place finish for those athletes. Uh, one of my favorite sports comparison graphics is this one. Um, and this was done by Kevin Quayley. And going back to the 2012 Summer Games in London, he looked at uh, where 100 meter uh, men's medal winners would finish compared to Usain Bolt. Um, and it's an interesting chart that goes back um, over 100 years. But what I found even more interesting is what uh, Kevin and um, Graham Roberts did um, based on this graphic. And so they wanted to take a look at Bolt and uh, make a comparison going back to 1896. So in order to do that, you have to look at each racer's average speed. So um, you could see them over time. And this top down view is essentially the previous chart, just sort of turned on its side and, and replaced with 3D models. So um, you can go down the line here and see that you know, you've got Bolt essentially competing with himself uh, four years prior. And then um, Carl Lewis in the 80s, who won uh, multiple golds, which is uh, rare actually in the 100. Um, if you keep going down the list, uh, let's see, you get Jim Hines, um, who is the first man to break 10 seconds in the Olympics. Um, then go down to Jesse Owens, who won four golds in Berlin. Uh, keep going down, you get Arch, uh, Archie Hahn, the Milwaukee Meteor. And if you go all the way down to, to 1896, these athletes are pretty far behind uh, where Bolt finished in 2012. In fact, they're more than 60 feet um, behind, which is a pretty considerable distance. Another thing that Kevin looked at with this was uh, the US medalists compared to the British medalists um, and increasingly uh, popular uh, Caribbean medalists in the 100. Um, so, uh, you know, half of the winners are Americans, but that's going away. You're seeing um, a lot of change there. Um, one other thing that Kevin did was look at uh, kids and um, some of the fastest kids and where they might finish compared to Usain Bolt. So as you can see here, they're pretty far behind. But if you look at this from the side, they're actually not that far behind when you look at some of the athletes going back to 1896. So fastest eight-year-old, uh, not too far behind the bronze medalist in 1896. Um, and if you take the fastest 15 or 16 year old, uh, they would actually have won a bronze medal right behind the silver medalist in 1980, which is pretty impressive. Um, so uh, even with all these advancements in training and gear and, and um, uh, even given all of that, there's only about a three second difference over time you know, where people would finish, where they would cross the line. So uh, one of my favorite sports comparison uh, graphics uh, that's out there. So getting back to Bolt, um, this is something we put together uh, in Rio. And um, basically, Usain Bolt can put more force into the ground in a shorter amount of time than anyone he's racing. And that's how he wins. Um, he's actually not that fast out of the starting blocks. Um, so if you want to beat him, you have to, you have to gain 
you have to create a huge gap early on. So Justin Gatlin did that, and he was winning most of uh, the first half of this race. But that intense downward force uh, is what propels uh, Bolt forward. And it basically means he's winning the race in the last 20 meters, um, which we can see here by looking at these photos at these particular timestamps. And we use composites a lot. We've used them a lot in the past. Um, and anyone who's looked at our coverage of the Olympics, uh, you're used to seeing these. You might, might wonder why the New York Times does so many of these composites. Well. One of the reasons is we don't have the broadcast rights. So we can't shoot video at the games. So we have to shoot photos, um, but we can take those photos and display the results in a couple of different ways. And so here's Simone Biles. You can see key moments off the vault and we've added some annotation. Um, and the composites are, there. they also give us the opportunity to show off things like motion um, and paths and thing like, things like that. So um, they are good for showing certain things. And you can also get a sense for the athletes, uh, very subtle but critical movements that make the difference between gold and silver. They're also great for, uh, you know, they're, they're good for showing a single athlete through time, but they're great for these relative comparisons between athletes um, in the same space who are competing at different times. So the camera metadata is very helpful for this since we have the capture time down to a hundredth of a second. So here we can show how far back Lindsey Vaughn would have been uh, if they were racing at the same time. Um, and here you can see the spatial differences between two athletes racing at different times where their paths are critical and the delta between these athletes is basically what determines who wins. So we built tools internally to help, uh, to help us make these composites. And we've done a lot of them. Um, and graphics like these are some, uh, something that we can build while we're at the games. And, and that's another um, uh, crucial thing for us is to be able to produce and publish some content um, based on these athletes' performances at the games, not too long after the competition ends, because we, you know, we want to get the story up as quickly as possible. So um, it usually takes us a few hours uh, to build and annotate and publish them. Um, and we've used uh, other techniques to showcase athletes before the games begin. So we tend to use these composites uh, or have in the past used these composites a lot at the games, but before we like to feature some athletes and show some of their, uh, to profile them and, and kind of focus on some aspect of their uh, athleticism. So here's an interactive we built for Nathan Chen. Uh, he's known for his quadruple jumps or quads. Um, that's four rotations uh, in the air several times during his routine. And he can do quite a few of these. Um, I think he, in this particular instance, he did five of them. And so we kind of break down what it takes to be able to do one of these. So um, you see sort of his uh, approach, what he has to do with his feet, the angle, which is essentially like what a pole vaulter would do to try and propel, uh, propel themselves into the air. And so we used a 3D body scan um, to create a 3D model. Um, and uh, Joe Ward, who I uh, worked with, uh, figured out that it's 440 RPMs to, to um, do a quad. So then we calculated what that would be, uh, how much faster that is than a triple uh, or a double. And you can actually see the difference um, between these. Um, and when we take a top down view, it's kind of crazy how fast you're spinning to actually do these quads. And I, apparently it's very uncomfortable. So uh, it's one of the reasons you don't see more of them. Um, but some of the motion capture data that we've uh, captured, um, we can't use uh, because it doesn't work well once an uh, athlete leaves the ground. Um, here you can see all the quads that um, Nathan Chen uh, will do. And we also took a look at where he will do these on the ice. Um, he has to give himself enough time to rest between them because they are pretty physically demanding. So at the games, um, we were able to put together some of these composites um, based on his performance. So uh, he spins so fast that it's tough to get a photo of him at all the angles, even with a high frame rate. 
Um, he actually performs six of these. Um, and uh, to make up for the fact that he uh, had a, uh, a um, he fell to 17th place. So these six actually brought him back up to um, uh, seventh, I believe. Um, so you can see this, his quad toe takeoff uh, as he's traveling backwards. And um, he, on one of these, he actually put both hands on the ice. So we have that as well. This is a profile of Chloe Kim, who um, is by many accounts the best female snowboarder in the world. We wanted to show how she accomplishes her double 180 in the half pipe. And basically the method on her first maneuver gets her in the air with enough height to perform the double 180 on the other side of the half pipe. So she's 15 feet in the air. She needs that height um, to gain the speed uh, required across the half pipe so that she can actually do the double 180. So as she goes up, upper body needs to rotate. Um, then she'll grab her board, which looks cool, uh, but also uh, helps in making her more compact so she can spin faster. And then she lands the double 180, which is crazy and pretty cool. Um, so Knowing that, uh, as we did this profile of her before going into the games, we could take a look at where she took off um, and how she performed uh, in Pyeongchang. And you can see in her first method here uh, against her competitors, she's farther down the half pipe. Um, and uh, that means that she gets, uh, that helps her in getting the momentum that she needs also for her double 180. So you can take a look at one of her other moves here, not uh, double 180, but still impressive. And then um, uh, one other composite that we had was at the bottom of this, where you can see between, um, if you look at the start and the method at the top there, you'll notice that as she's coming off of those, the distance between um, these snapshots after the method is much wider, um, which means she's traveling much faster, which gives her the, um, the speed she needs. Um, one of the last things I want to look at here is what's the best way to show an outstanding performance? And uh, Katie Ledecky finished the 800 meter freestyle in 11.4 seconds, 11.4 uh, seconds ahead of the sil silver medalist in Rio. So this photo is great, but it doesn't really capture uh, the distance by which she won. So um, here you have Ledecky swimming in one direction and everyone else swimming in the other direction. Um, and podium photos are great. Uh, and they, they're great at showing how these uh, world-class athletes are feeling afterwards. Smiles, tears, a lot of different emotions from athletes who spent most of their lives training for this day. Um, but again, this doesn't capture the impressiveness of what she did in the pool. Um, and we could provide a chart to show how significant the gap was, which we did. And the chart is interesting uh, when you consider that 48 years earlier, um, the gold medal time was a minute and 20 seconds slower. And also you can see her on here twice. It's a uh, full 10 seconds faster than her own performance only four years prior. But in the end, this captures Ledecky's accomplishments uh, um, like no other uh, visual form can. Um, you see that distance, you see where everyone else is, uh, is in the pool, and even the crowd holding up their phones and cameras sort of adds to this moment. It, it, it provides a little bit more excitement to what actually just happened. Uh, and that's it. Wow, well, that was great. Thanks so much. So we have a few questions. Um, I'll go ahead and order. So one, one was about the, the, the uh, the comparison across the years for the 100 meter sprint. Mm -hmm. Are you able to, co this comes from Constance Villalba. Are you able to correlate temporal increase in performance with advancements in, a in attendant equipment and footwear advances? Well, I, I think it's certainly easier um, to do that with other longer distances um, because we're, that, you know, that some of the, the time differences here are very, uh, are very small. Also, going back to 1896, you know, we're not able to 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 get any kind of reasonable um, data going back that far. Uh, if you start talking about equipment, 
<laughs> those kinds of advancements. But um, obviously, people are looking at this. You know, any way to 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 gain an edge, um, you know, a couple hundredths of a second um, is pretty important. So um, there, you're going to you're going to see uh, a lot more focus on equipment and also training techniques. I mean, when I mentioned before that uh, Bolt puts more force into the ground than anyone else uh, that he's racing, and, and uh, but his foot doesn't stay on the ground as long. It basically means he puts more force into the ground in a shorter amount of time. And we've had we've talked to uh, biomechanists uh, about this uh, way of running, and so you're seeing younger athletes now training in different ways uh, based on that that concept. Yeah. Yeah, I also saw a talk, someone pointing out that the way we choose athletes has changed dramatically throughout the years where it used to be that they all look the same. And now we have the shot put looks different than the 100 meter than the than the mile runner. Um, we select them specifically for the sport. Uh, so the other there's another related question or more of a comment that that talks about a YouTube video about Bolt versus Owen where they adjust for for the surface and apparently they weren't they weren't as far as as, as you would think uh, so the, the last question here is is one from regina news is a similar question that i was going to ask i'll combine them so you you've shown some the, the, some of these visualizations are are they combine beauty and in for and in, 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 in information in in a way that's that's incredible like you you can actually get an insight from looking at them and understand numbers from looking at them while at the same time enjoying the aesthetics. So the question that we have, me and Regina, is if you can tell, tell us a little bit about how much time does it go, do you spend thinking about those two or, or even three aspects of it, like the aspect of actually getting, being able to communicate the numbers uh, to making it understandable and also beautiful. Yeah, I think it really depends on um, the athlete, the sport, and visually what you're going to get out of it um, anyway. I mean, there are um, there are different ways to do any one of these uh, these examples that I showed you, right? We could we could chart um, some of these things. We could just show you photos, um, but in at least in, in my department at the times, you know, we're, we're a very visual desk, but we also work with data all the time. So we're constantly trying to combine those two things. Um, you never see what ends up on the cutting room floor and there's a lot of it. So, um, you know, sometimes we work on a concept for a long time ahead of the games or um, just generally on um, some other news story and it just never sees the light of day. Um, and that's because it just doesn't capture what we want to show um, in a way that we think is, is the best way to show it. So, you know, there's plenty of stuff that we've tried and is, we've just never published um, because we did, just didn't feel right. So, I mean, there's a lot of editing involved. And I think for a lot of people when they're, when they're trying to make um, these kinds of, of graphics or visual representations, um, you know, we, they don't have uh, as many editing steps as we might have. You know, we get a lot of people looking at it. There are a lot of people that have to sort of, th that have input uh, on, on the way it looks, uh, the words we choose, um, you know, the, the form in which we present it. Is, is it scroll-based? Is it a video? Is it, um, are we just showing something in sequence? How does it look on mobile? I mean, these are all considerations um, going into each one of these graphics. So. I guess the answer to the question is there's no formula. Mm -hmm. um, it's just a lot of uh, a lot of trial and error, and um, hopefully landing on something that that, that we all feel good with um, um, going into the games. Great, that was great. Very very beautiful. So um, that's the end of our of our talks. Thank you everybody for for coming.